Okay, welcome to the plenary session on mapping the healthy democracy ecosystem. I am Matt Leininger. I'm the director of the Center for Democracy Innovation at the National Civic League. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Carolyn here. Uh, Carolyn Lukensmeyer, my colleague for many years, is a pioneer in many different sorts of democracy innovation, starting in the Clinton-Gore administration, then founding and uh, running America Speaks for many years, founding and running the National Institute for Civil Discourse. Uh, and Carolyn also has, over many occasions, brought me into these projects where we're trying to boil the ocean, and I'm a little tired of it. Um, but I'm also very grateful <laughs> to be involved in these things, and we're excited about kind of sharing with you the ocean that we're boiling today, uh, which is made possible by the support of the Konar and Gosman Family Foundations. Carolyn. Thank you very much, Matt. You can't boil an ocean without great partners, right? So what I'm going to do is give you a preview of the kind of work we've been doing for about nine months now on mapping the healthy ecosystem of democracy in the country. This has definitely been a collective effort. We start with a core team, myself, Matt, and I'd like to ask Nick and Halla and Rachel to stand because they all have put hours of work into this. We've also been aided by additional researchers, Anna Gallus and Amy Saracen. We also have had the access to tech specialists, both from the National Conference on Citizenship, the Bridge Alliance, and an extraordinary private sector organization called Decision Path. Equally important have been collaborators in terms of organizations that have really put both human equity and financial equity into what we're doing. Citizens and Scholars, the National Civic League, the Democracy Funders Network, and Johns Hopkins New Institute on the, the modern agora. The last category, which will continue to grow, is those of you who have shared data and expertise. And many of you in this audience are from these organizations. And the next time we show this, we're going to need a whole slide to show the shared data and expertise. Let me jump in. The project background, mission, what are we trying to do? We really have two purposes to actually identify, categorize, and quantify the existing organizations, networks, and funders who are doing positive work to protect and to evolve American democracy. Equally important, our product. Our desire is to create a compelling interactive resource that really empowers users. And who are the users? We have four audiences. Many of you in this room are the practitioners who we believe will really benefit from this ecosystem. Partly, many speakers have already mentioned that particularly since 2016, 2016, there's been a proliferation of organizations doing this work. We hope this exercise, this work, will become a resource for more collaboration, maybe even merger, because the point is to take the work to scale to have more impact. Second, funders. We know because we hear from them, particularly people leading family foundations of significant size, but not the megas. They want to help with democracy, but they don't know where to invest that makes sense. So that's a target, and clearly to bring more money into the entire field. Many communities around the country, community leaders, whether they're elected or business or social innovators, they want to bring this kind of work to their community, but they're not aware of the resources who could help them do that. And finally, and frankly, <laughs> hmm. Wow. I'm <laughs> having a moment. One that's closest to my own heart is the American public. I've had the privilege for 30 years of working with citizens and residents in communities all over this country. More than 75% of us know that where we are is wrong and they want to do something about it. But they've given up because it's too complex, it's too toxic, it's too... So two words capture this for me. To re-stimulate hope and inspiration and a connection to engagement. This will be the toughest given how media works. We will need all of your help to actually accomplish that. 
the process so far. We did a strategy session with 25 leaders here in Washington. We then enhanced that with 50 more interviews of leaders in the field. Then we actually wanted to go to the collaboration level, which I already mentioned. And we also wanted to do data, we are doing data collection, lists, data serves, public records. We are doing our own experimentation with AI for data scraping, but always confirming it with some human check. So how do you define this ecosystem? The first challenge, what are the criteria for inclusion? I'm not going to give you all the detail today, but you will get after the conference all the materials we've generated. So don't worry if you don't get all the detail. We want to inform, promote, protect. Equally important, we had to decide who are we going to exclude. And we chose two categories. We're doing nothing that is related to partisan politics and elections. And particularly in our current environment, no organization that has any link to violence or hate mongering. Next concentric circle. We knew that we had to categorize the kinds of work in democracy. And those of you in the field know that this is already being done in many, many different ways. We tried to go up 30,000 feet and say, what are about 12 categories that will cover everybody's work? None of them will surprise you. Civic education, national service, voter engagement. We did that with the experts who tend to look at this, again, at generalizations. Equally important was to actually work with the organizations themselves. We've talked with many leaders, practitioners, and used their own language when they tell us what they are doing. And that we categorized as goals. And when you see the map, you'll see that how people are positioned on the map are a connection between the 12 categories and the 51 goals that came directly from community leaders. The database. Anybody that I've told this to in the last couple of months is very surprised. We already have 10,300 organizations in the database with data. My personal expectation is that before we're done, that'll probably be increased by a factor of five. The data that's in about each organization, name, website, mission statement, contact information. Also, of course, important is the financial data, their resources, their grants, their tax status. Then the categories of work that I just described to you will be connected to each organization. And finally, part of the goal, remember, is to increase our capacity to be leveraging our work for impact. So we've also identified every network and coalition we can find that's working on this protection and evolving our democracy. Eventually what the maps will show is the links between all these organizations, but I'm now gonna turn it over to Matt to actually show you a few of the visualizations. And we're actually going to be looking not at slides anymore. We're going to be looking at the actual uh, database, at the actual visualizations coming from the platform itself. Usually, eventually, you will be able to do this as well. You'll be able to look at the maps, manipulate them, look at the dashboards and the financial information. But we're just going to give you a, a preview of what you will be able to do once this resource is fully uh, operational. Uh, our colleague Rachel Fersh, back there in the uh, engine room of the uh, Starship Enterprise, is the one who's actually manipulating this through her laptop. Uh, and the first look you've got here is geography, right? So, so the, top, the top map here, this is the number of organizations in the database, according to the state, the, the darker blue colors, you know, more, more organizations. Uh, you also see, moving the states here, you've got kind of geographic density on the left, and then a tax class on the right. We can zoom in on Minnesota, for example, and kind of show you within Minnesota different sorts of groups. Uh, we are heavy at this point on nonprofit organizations. Their data is e easier to get. We also, though, have a number of for-profits, and we're getting more of those. We also have some uh, university-based centers, things like that, where they're themselves not the nonprofit, but they're, they're based at a larger nonprofit. So there's all these kind of complications as far as assembling the groups uh, according to their 990 data and other sorts of things. But we are, we are hard to work at this uh, with all of our partners. Uh, so the um, next thing we're going to show you is a network map. Uh, we're going to show you kind of some of the... Um, 
uh, some of the, the ways in which people are connected, some of these organizations are connected. We have a total right now of 77 networks on the map, and part of what we've been doing here is by approaching people, including many of you, and asking you for your lists, for your data, so that you can help us stitch all these, these uh, networks together. Um, and so here you see the 77 that we have. They're grouped, of course, the, the size of those circles is based on the number of, of organizations in each of those networks. Uh, you can click on an individual network, uh, like Fix Us, for example, and see all the different groups that are belonging to that network. The, the dots, the colors of the dots, uh, indicate whether an organization is a member of one network or uh, green, uh, green dots are two, uh, pink dots are, are three, and many organizations are members of four plus networks. And here's uh, one example, more perfect union. <laughs> Give me one example, just one. <laughs> <laughs> Pick one. <laughs> um, this one is the Horizons Project. Okay, and so they're a member of BMAC and the Bridge Alliance and Citizen Connect, Listen First, Trust Network. And so you can kind of see and begin to understand kind of how these things uh, are connected um, from different, uh, different networks. And then the last uh, kind of main view that we'll be able to show you today is this dashboard, uh, which has uh, financial information as well as other sorts of things on it. Um, and so what we've done to make this uh, easier to visualize for you is we just picked 17 organizations of different parts of the country, different types of organizations. Um, and, and so what you can see is with this group of 17, you can kind of see the kind of overall set of uh, kind of the revenue and how it has grown or declined over time of the group and of, uh, uh, as a whole and of each organization within the group. Um, then you can click on one. Voto Latino Foundation, for example, or Issue One, and it'll give you not only the, the financial data uh, on that organization, it'll also kind of display at the bottom the goals that they are mainly uh, focused on and also whichever networks uh, and coalitions that they're part of. So that's kind of the, the, the main guts of it. And as Carolyn said, this has been a kind of a combination of kind of the manual labor of us talking to the people we know and people helping us out by giving us data uh, and giving us some of their expertise, and also now starting to use AI in what we hope is a good and responsible and time-saving way in the sense that we're able to kind of scrape uh, the, the web to find zip codes for organizations, uh, some uh, EIN numbers, things like that. We're also moving to the point where we can be using our tags, our 50 tags that, that Carolyn mentioned, to, to tag organizations to get a better sense of what each of them are trying to do. I think, Carolyn, it's now back to you. Great. So we invited three people who sit in different positions in the ecosystem to comment on this first showing of what we're trying to accomplish. On my immediate left is Nick Taylor, a director from the Charles Koch Foundation and a member of the Stand Together Trust. Stand Together is an amazing initiative to actually bring people in a community to solve issues using their diversity, rather in spite of their diversity. On his left is Angela Romans. She's actually here in two roles. She is a member of the National Civic League Board, but in terms of our work, she is the executive director of a network called Innovations in Equity. So we wanted that perspective to be part of our panel. And on the far left is Richard Young, the founder and executive director of Civic Lex. One of the most interesting things about Civic Lex as we've looked at hundreds of organizations is they actually do activities at the community level in several categories of democracy work. Most organizations keep their work defined in one lane. Richard's organization does local media, does bridge building, does go collaborative governance, and I think I forgot one. Oh, yeah, civic education. <laughs> oh, that one. <laughs> that one. So, we don't have a lot of time, but we've asked the panelists first to respond to, given what you saw in the three maps that we were, visualizations that we were able to share, what really stands out to you? And at least I'll just start with you, Nick, and run down. Yeah, absolutely, thank you. Uh, I mean, first of all, I just want to, I can't, I don't think we can overstate how ambitious the project is um, and how remarkable <laughs> it is that you're pulling all this data together. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, re really uh, kudos to you all for even undertaking this endeavor, boiling the ocean, I think mm. uh, Matt pointed out. Um, you know, just at first glance, we got a chance to preview it a few days ago and just see some of the, the, the initial findings here. 
a couple of things that really jumped out to me from, from my perspective was the, the ecosystem map, right? So the, the connections between these organizations. Um, it, it's it, un, not surprising, but maybe a, somewhat unfortunate, I think, is like the pinks and purples, right? Which is like more, like, uh, more connections, more yes. networks, much fewer of those, right? Yes. And so I think what that, this suggests, and I think what probably everyone who works in this space would probably agree with is, there's a sense of like a fractured environment, right? There are organizations who have their own goals, their own incentives, they're working towards something very specific and maybe they're not as connected to some of these other issues. And, and I think that's, um, that's, un that's unfortunate for, for us doing this work. Um, something else that's, uh, that uh, the, there is, I, the, I know that this is only a snapshot of 17 of the organizations, but like the, the funding blip, right, that happens in 2021, I'm sure there's lots of reasons that could be funneling into that. But something that I do worry about in the democracy space is that there's a um, uh, so, sort of reactionary or, um, it can go in cycles, right, where it, um, philanthropy will get involved or donors will be involved, and it's the race of, oh, there's another election coming, right, or there's an inflection point. Um, and I think the, what most of us who operate in this space really think, well, when we think about it, we want it to see a sustained yeah. ecosystem, right, that's engaged over time. Um, so that obviously jumped out. Um, the other, I was really surprised by the, the really small um, uh, blurb for, for local news in the network system. Um, this is an issue that doesn't matter, doesn't matter who I talk to. Um, the news media ecosystem comes up and then immediately it funnels into a conversation about, well, it's, it's the lack of local news. I know it's surprising to me that they were such a small um, kind of piece of that, that network function. Um, and I do think they will grow as we add less more organizations. That could be the case yeah. too as well. So I have a couple other thoughts, but I don't want to dominate the time Great. here, so I'll. Angela, thank you very much, Nick. Yeah, of course. Yes, uh, absolutely. Well, thank you. To everyone who's been involved in this effort, my head was just spinning as I um, saw these visualizations. You know, first and foremost, the emphasis on ecosystem. The, as someone who has spent my career doing education ecosystem building, it's been it was really exciting to see this map, um, to have that be the emphasis. And um, and I think, as Nick said, so what it raised for me is how can we bring in those organizations that aren't as networked? What can we in the broader ecosystem do to reach out to them, to connect with them? So with my board hat on um, from the National Civic League, you know, how can organizations like ours and others reach out to, to, the, to those um, that are in the, whatever the color was, the pinks, the, the yeah. least connected, right? right. Um, so both the emphasis and then the question of how to, how to build up the ecosystem even more. Um, it also made me think selfishly, maybe, um, in my day job and in my board job of other mapping efforts. So particularly around education, around leadership development, the spaces that I spend my day job in, you know, how, how can this be used as a model for other mapping networks for other fields? And I'm, you know, my, my, I'm already thinking about like, pitches to funders about how to do that. <laughs> so uh, if any education funders are in the room, look for me uh, to come to you. But I love this as a model for other potential mapping networks. Yes, it is ambitious, and I think that's something that we need to, to continue. Um, I, you know, some of, some of the granular things, so as, as Nick talked about the blip in 2021, it made me think, what, what initiated that? Mm -hmm. Tied to elections, certainly, maybe, but it didn't happen in 2016, so what yeah. caused that blip for 2021? how to sustain it, as Nick said, but really just how to, how to interrogate that and ask some questions of funders and funder networks and organizations um, to see if, there's, if there was something in that moment that we can pull forward and advocate to happen more often. Um, and then just some, one granular thing, um, I noticed the care that the designers took in using language. I, you know, I loved, I read, you know, every word, um, and really appreciate the care that it obviously took to, to come to those definitions, to think of, to talk about how, who was excluded and the language you used. I'm a little bit caught up in the citizens versus residents and advocate more for the use of residents as someone who, you know, works in spaces uh, with lots of folks of color, just the, using citizens. It can be tricky and can be off-putting. So just you know, thinking about that, and I know you've taken great care in language. And then also from that hat, um, from that lens, wondering if there are, if there are any ways to search 
for organizations that are working specifically around de um, healthy democracy and identity, so the intersection mm. of those two. Okay. So okay. organizations that might be working yeah. with youth or people of color or women or right. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't know if that's in the next iteration, but just wondering if there are ways to do that. Great question. Before going to you, Richard, I want to follow up on one of the things that you said, Angela, and that you noted about the local news being underpopulated at this point, mm -hmm. but also almost completely isolated not really connected to other networks. And I think that's a problem for us working in democracy that we haven't linked that yet. And I know lots of us are now working on it, but that's another thing we hope that gets shown is how do we create those connections? Richard. Great, yeah, no, so uh, thank you again for, for, for this really amazing um, platform. I think it's gonna be really transformational and I think the thing that's so exciting for me and really meaningful, like deeply meaningful for me personally is the sort of inherent recognition of local work that is that is happening through it, right? I think too often this field is talked about a lot at, na at the national level, there are a lot of national organizations mm -hmm. and folks doing the work on the ground in communities um, aren't, aren't easily found. And the recognition that this brings by actually showing, um, showing where everyone is working on these issues across the country I think is really important. Um, and so that sort of brings me to, to one of the things that stood out when I was looking at it and that is the sort of inherent geographic disparity that exists across the country for this work. Mm -hmm. um, I'm in Kentucky, that's where I'm from, that's where my organization is based. We only work in, in, in my, uh, my hometown of Lexington. And you know, if you look at, uh, I was actually you know, pretty pleasantly surprised at the number of organizations in Kentucky, but especially as you look out to, to the west, mm -hmm. right, before you hit the coast, it is, it is pretty sparse mm -hmm. um, between the sort of you know, Midwest and, and the west. And I think, you know, there's a real challenge in this sort of urban centricity of this field um, and the sort of lack of deep, meaningful, on the ground engagement of rural communities. And I think that is just clearly thrown up there in that map. Um, and I think it's incredibly problematic for, for the field. Um, but I think, you know, so that's the negative part, <laughs> the, the sad part. But the positive part, I think it's like the sheer number of organizations on there is incredibly exciting. And the possibility um, of, of organizing these groups, you know, I looked at, at the map, um, you know, looking at, at Kentucky and just like the idea of how many different organizations we, we could, that we can get together as we look to sort of helping to grow this field in our state yes. is really, really exciting. Um, yeah, and I'll talk more about that. But those are the two things that, um, the sort of relationship that this is going to be able to, how this, platform is going to be able to change the field's relationship to place-based work is very exciting for me. Extremely well said. Before I take you to the second question, your emphasis on the issue about underrepresentation of rural, this was mentioned in a previous session, I think by you, Michelle, that a positive thing coming down the road not too long from now is the launch of the Trust for Civic Infrastructure, and they have strategically chosen that the investments will be predominantly in rural and small town America. Yep which is fantastic. Uh, okay, uh, next question is, okay, we get what you think about it at a big picture. Now we really want to know how will you and your organization use it? And I'll start with Richard and come back this way. Yep, sure. So um, I think there are really, th you know, as I've been sort of reflecting on this um, in advance of today, I feel like there are three sort of main, main things that I feel like we're going to be able to use this for, and I'm really excited for each of them. So the first one, is, is helping us find peers. Um, so, you know, Carolyn, you mentioned this, we're sort of a, an, a little bit of an odd bird. Um, you know, we are a local news organization. We cover every single public meeting in our city. We also do baseline civic education work with adults and young folks. Um, we uh, do work on collaborative governance with our local government to open it up to be more participatory. We do public space work. We do a lot of different sort of civic health work in Lexington, um, and only in Lexington. Um, but, the challenge is that we often, um, as we're looking out into the national field, have trouble finding people that are working at these same intersection points. And there's a lot of really critical learnings for folks doing place-based work um, about these intersections of different parts of the ecosystem that I feel like we're really missing out on, lessons learned, um, you know, strategies that we could share because we can't find them. Um, and that is, and it's a real challenge. And it's like, you know, when we first started, knowing that we wanted to take this approach to sort of focusing on different parts of the ecosystem, um, 
that was one of the things we sought out, and it's just really hard to find. So that's the first thing, is just finding other, finding kindred spirits out there across the country that are doing this work. Um, the second one is helping others find us, but particularly national folks. Um, so, you know, I do place-based work, and by place-based work, I mean, you know, only in one place. <laughs> um, and, and are there, how many other, like, place-based practitioners are there here? Okay, cool, great. So we got a, we got a, we got a few of us. And as I'm sure y'all know, it is incredibly hard to sort of break through the sort of shell of your place and have folks in other places actually see the work that you're doing. Discoverability in the field is really, really hard for place-based practitioners. Um, and so I'm really excited for that opportunity for people to be able to find, uh, find organizations like us. Um, and the third part, third thing, I promise I'll stop talking. Um, the third thing is, um, field building in Kentucky. So I'm part of an, of an effort of about five of us that are doing this type of work across the state to build a statewide organization to support our field um, and, uh, and to help, help fund our field. And as we're looking to build this, this entity, the ability to like rapidly find all of the organizations across the state that are, that are doing this work, I think is gonna be really transformational for us mm -hmm. in organizing this, this effort that we think could be really, really um, impactful to changing the sort of civic culture of our state. Um, and as you said, Caroline, I mean, working towards that collective impact, um, especially at a state level, um, could have really, really pretty significant um, sort of uh, impact, yeah. Thank you. Amanda. Yeah, um, thanks, Caroline. I, um, so I love the, the way that you framed it, finding others and having others find us. And so I was thinking about it with that same lens as well with both of my hats. So in the um, education space, because education and you know, a democratic education and democracy in general are inextricably linked, um, thinking about how my organization, which works with a, a, a lot of different um, senior leaders in education across the ecosystem, how folks in different sectors can find peers, um, so thinking about the folks in our space who are doing policy work and advocacy work and how can they, in, in the education space specifically, but how can they find others um, who are doing similar work nationally and locally. Um, and with my sort of board hat uh, as the person who's the program committee chair of the National Civic League board, how can we find partners um, at the place-based level that we could potentially work with um, and support in, in our capacity building efforts, um, as well as how can we find other national organizations to sort of pull up and, and build um, these, these national coalition partnerships. So definitely that. Um, also with the education hat, really, I've been thinking and talking a lot about school boards, and some folks in this room have heard me talk about school boards, um, but it, you know, where we are right now, this moment that we are in in education, very few people are talking about school boards as, um, as a potential <coughs> positive lever uh, for the work that needs to happen to protect a democratic education. And so thinking about organ local organizations um, that school board members can partner with um, in you know, education efforts to counter all the miseducation that's happening, what's actually happening in our school system people in your local community, in our local community, actually care about, in a positive way, education, um, things like that. So getting the word out um, and finding other partners to get the word out, definitely. Um, and, and just really to, to change this narrative around education and, and sort of a positive democratic education. Um, and then there's sort of one other, yeah, there are a bunch of other <laughs> ways that I can think about it too, but the, I think those in particular, so from the education standpoint and then from, uh, from the National Civic League standpoint. Thank you. Take it away, Nick. Yeah, all right, so I tried to put on like two different hats for how this might be used here. So from a philanthropy standpoint then from like a, a research standpoint, which is sort of the intersection of most of the work that I do. Mm -hmm. Um, so just from a, a big picture philanthropy perspective, first of all, I think, you know, you had mentioned, you know, how do you help other funders, like mid-sized to large funders, be involved in this space? And uh, this field, I, I think everyone who works in it will admit that it can feel paralyzing at times, right? There's just, there's so many organizations, there's so many um, entwined incentives, folks are working towards different goals. And if you were just trying to figure out how can you make a difference there and how can you leverage your resources and dollars to make a difference, um, even knowing where to start. I think can be extremely challenging. And a resource like this, I think, could be just tremendously valuable for those types of organizations 
identifying who the players are, um, what the different goals are, what the potential incentives are, um, who are the biggest players, where, you know, where can they start doing their outreach, find places to put a shovel in, um, identifying funding gaps, right? So you, know, yes. you could look at something like local news maybe, right, and say, hey, like, that seems really important to me, seems under-resourced, right? Uh um, understanding that maybe your goal is to find the big players and to provide them with more resources to keep driving. Maybe it's to identify, you know, where the where does the marginal value add of your yep. dollars, right? So how can you help underleveraged organizations? Um, how can you identify those that are most aligned with your individual vision, right? Individual philanthropies have different goals. Um, and absent some sort of tool to understand who's receiving resources, what their goals are, what they're doing. This can be a really, really daunting endeavor that, um, you know, it, it, or I, if, uh, organizations that are funding in this space can spend years just trying to figure out how they should be engaged. And that's a, a waste of time and resources, honestly. Yeah. Um, so to be able to provide some shortcuts here for folks, I think, is, is tremendously valuable. Um, so that's, you know, big picture philanthropy standpoint. I think this is, is going to be an invaluable tool. Um, from a, uh, just a, I think, from a research perspective, there's a tremendous value in how this can be overlaid with other projects that are currently um, operating in this space, right? So just I just kind of brainstormed a few ways in which like you could overlay um, different data sets with the with what you have here. So you could look at electoral outcomes by geography. Does that correlate with the density of these organizations? Are they making a difference? Um, uh, behavior surveys, right? World value surveys, asking questions about you know, volunteer hours that people are engaged in. Can you overlay that? Are people engaged in these civic organizations? Are they opting out? Um, behaviors of citizens in general. Uh, there's there's tr there's a, an enormous amount of data surveying the public on polar polarized attitudes, yes. um, support yeah. for political violence, support for democratic norm violations. Again, asking the questions of is it in these civic deserts? Is that where we're seeing it? Is it somewhere else? Mm -hmm. Um, social mobility is another way in which you might you think about this. Um, voting rates, right? Like where are voting rates highest? Where are they lowest? Do they overlay? Uh, I think that list, I could keep going and going and going, but um, <laughs> I think this, this is going to be a, a very valuable tool for anyone who's doing research in this space, particularly those who are asking questions around um, what difference are these organizations making? Mm -hmm. Well, I have to say, none of us knew what our three panelists were going to say. <laughs> I'll speak for myself, but my guess is the whole core team would join this in a very, very resounding chorus. To hear the items that you've defined, having local organizations be more visible to national organizations, attracting more funding to the field. I won't try to say it all over again, but literally everything we've talked about as the potential of this mapping exercise has been stated by you. And that is pretty thrilling for our step into this field with still a huge amount of work to do. I'm going to ask you one more question, and whoever wants to respond first is fine. And in a way, Nick, you already said a lot about this, but please add. We focused on how your organization would use it, but equally important is how would the field use it if you actually look at what can take us from where we are in 2023 and the threats we feel to our democratic institutions and our democratic norms? How does this become a meaningful resource in that, at that level? I, I can jump in there. Um, so my, my organization's in an interesting position in the field because we are this local organization that does uh, work across a number of different ecosystems or parts of the ecosystem. Because that's the case, we have, I feel like, this sort of bottom-up view of what this has from a top-down. And what we see, you know, we're deeply involved in the local news field. Um, you know, we are, well, last year spoke about our work at the Night Media Forum. Like, it is a significant, probably the thing that we're most known for. And that sort of, there's a huge amount of resources going into that through Press Forward, through the Knight Foundation and MacArthur Foundation and, and, and various others. And um, that is a field that is going to explode in the next year or two. And it is not plugged in to any of the healthy democracy work True. that any other parts of the field are doing at all. I mean, uh, I was just talking with someone um, from a, a, another uh, place-based local news organization, and um, there's all of this work in the ecosystem that they just had no idea existed. And those are all organizations that are place-based inherently, right? They are organizations that know their community. They have 
sometimes trusted, sometimes not trusted relationships uh, in their community. And so the idea of sort of bringing in that piece of the, uh, that piece of the network into this, I think is, has really tremendous opportunity. But then that's the same for all of the other pieces of this ecosystem, right? I mean, the, from where we sit, we see the same conversations happening over and over in each sort of silo of the field. And so it's really exciting to, to think about the potential that that could have for the field in the next yeah. five years. I'm just going to add a concrete example of what you just said, if I could. As journalists have moved into shifting their perspective, beginning to work like this in local news, somewhat giving up the tradition of objectivity and acknowledging themselves as real members of these communities, one of the things many of them have felt required to do is to learn all the process facilitation skills that are necessary to hold effective public meetings across difference. Mm -hmm. And in several communities, we've been able to say, wait, you all don't have to learn those skills. Mm -hmm. There are plenty of people, whether they were trained by NIF or that they were trained by whoever they were trained by, mm -hmm. who are right there in your community, which then forwards the work much, much more quickly. Just one example. Amanda, think, anything you want to add? Sure. Um, I, you know, I'll, I'll go back again to saying that this raises up the importance of ecosystem work which, you know, this is the choir. <laughs> we all know how important it is for organizations to be networked. That is not a part of the average everyday, you know, resident's language um, or perspective, unfortunately. Um, I know, because I've been <laughs> trying to build ecosystems across education silos for, for many years. So um, I think raising up the importance of, of ecosystem work. Um, and then thinking about the, I think the, how, how this mapping project, and I've said it before, so I'll just say it again, could be used for other organizations. What is it, what, what, how are organizations working on a healthy education system? How are organizations working on a healthy health system? So the, the sort of um, subsections of a healthy democracy, right, all the different fields, um, I think could use this as a, as a mapping model, and that I'm very excited about as well. And I owe you an apology. I've called you Amanda, I just realized. <laughs> I've been called worse, so that's... <laughs> I, I hope so. <laughs> anyway, thank you. Sure. Nick, anything else you want to add? Yeah, I think I covered most of it in the kind of the specific examples I gave, but the, I think the overarching theme there is um, this is valuable because it brings together data and information for, for to your point, for funders, for researchers, and, and there's innumerable ways, I think, in which this is going to help a field that is otherwise pretty fractured, I think, in a lot of instances, yep. um, coalesce around a centralized information system. So. Thank you all very much. Please join me in acknowledging this panel. We're going to stay on stage, but we're going to now shift the focus for all of you to begin to give us some of your first reactions to what you've seen so far of the work we've done. So Angela, when you said that this uh, looking at this data and the visual visualizations makes your head spin, we want to say, yup, um, <laughs> us too. Uh, imagine your heads are spinning. And to give us a chance to kind of slow down the spinning and all that, uh, we wanted to have some conversation in the crowd here, we're also going to use Mentimeter to do some instant polling. And Rachel, I think, is going to put this up on the screen for us. Uh, but basically, what we want to do is start a process that will continue, actually, later today at the reception, which is the Healthy Democracy Map Mixer Reception, where we'll be inviting you to mix, mingle, mess with, and make better the Healthy Democracy Ecosystem Map. Um, and we'll be asking you, first of all, just now, we're, we're going to be asking you about your kind of basic impressions of this. Later on at the reception, we'll be asking you for your suggestions about ways to improve it, uh, organizations or types of organizations you think should be part of this, this database, other uh, stuff like that. So this is the beginning of a process we'll, that will continue later on today. So the first step, though, is if you just go ahead and start the Menti, if you just turn to your neighbor um, and talk for a few minutes here about uh, what stands out to you about what you've seen. And then after the, you've talked for a few minutes, I'm going to invite you to use the, the, uh, the instant polling to give your responses. And we'll be able to show those uh, as they come in on the screen. Not those responses. But <laughs> so please, uh, talk to your neighbor for five or, or so minutes about 
What is what is, stands out to you about what you've seen so far? I feel like we need like a mirror here. To really see. Yeah. Sure they'll have questions after this Yeah, uh, I, the, the main speaker said that they're not going to do a Q&A session now. Oh, okay. Um, but I think it's going to be... I guess they're getting prepped for breakout sessions, too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. well, uh, no, after this, we're doing lunch. Right, right. Lunch and breakout, yeah. No Q&A? No Q&A? All right.
So, so if you can, there's always a, hello, hello. Hey, hello out there. There's always a problem. There's always a problem when you give the power to the people. It's very hard to get it back. So we're going to respond for just a few minutes to our panelists and Matt and myself to things that we've seen. I'm going to take a couple of ones that were pretty factual that are important for you to know. Several of you asked, if my organization isn't up there, how does it get there? We're inviting you today to put your organization into a place at the reception tonight so that your organization can get in. And frankly, any others that you think we may have missed. Uh, there was one other one that I was, but if somebody else has got one immediately. What are the 12 categories? We won't try to say all of them to you. You're going to receive this after the conference, but it's things like civic education, civic tech, local media. Uh, electoral structural reforms like campaign finance, gerrymandering. So national service is another one. Matt, if you want to add a couple more. Bridge building. Bridge building. Oh, yeah, <laughs> bridge building, which has just exploded, of course. I have, um, I have one. Does my mic on? I have one, and then I'm going to maybe pitch it to Nick because Nick was just talking about this other one. Um, so the lack of diversity, uh, just aware, just uh, what I brought up earlier about working on issues of identity. Um, you know, people of color, work I do, women, youth, whatever. Um, uh, Richard was saying, well, you know, since so, so much of this is based on IRS data, it might be harder to tease that out. And I definitely acknowledge that. And also note that there's a category of folks working on immigration. So yes. there's subject yes. area categories. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think that, the, you know, we, we can figure out <laughs> how to figure out who's working with, again, with women who are working on people of color issues and especially organizations led by people of color, thinking from, you know, what we've heard from funders, um, that could be very useful. And then uh, Richard, uh, sorry, Nick was talking about impact. Um, that was somewhere in the corner over here as well. So I think the question was, is impact taken into account or something, and how is that measured? I mean, that's an interesting question. I, I, that's the one that you know, we were just debating is, um, you know, the really challenging question in this space is, like, who, who's impactful? In, in, what, in what ways are they impactful? Um, and I think there's all sorts of margins on which that can be measured, which probably is what makes it really difficult. Um, and, you know, somebody asked the question about, like, academics and researchers. You know, I mentioned this before. You know, really just being able to tie these to other ongoing trends, right? So um, states are seeing higher levels of voter turnout, right? Like that suggests something. Probably also a margin of like diminishing return at some point, right? Like yeah. at some point there's too many organizations, right? You're, um, you could even imagine like too many grassroots organizations competing for, for voter share. You can create rancor in those spaces. Like I think these are all questions about how do we understand the impact of these organizations. Um, and this tool, I think, could be really valuable for those things. So as it scrolled again, I did see a couple of the other fact questions that were asked that I'd like to fill in. When will this go live? I think I'm taking a deep breath. But sometime in first <laughs> quarter 2024, more likely the end of first quarter 2024, <laughs> there's a tremendous amount of work still to be done in terms of the data gathering and verifying that data. A really excellent question that we would expect you to ask is, the organization, the information you have, how does the organization verify that it's accurate? We plan to send out to every organization that is on this map the opportunity to add to, edit, or correct data about their own organization. That will be a massive effort. You all know what it <laughs> takes to get organizations to reply to requests like that. Um, but that is what's planned there. Do you have anyone you want to respond to? Yeah, um, I, I definitely see, uh, I've seen a couple, uh, and this maybe is just going to be my soapbox at the moment, but uh, <laughs> I've seen a number of folks like bringing up rural and, you know, rural communities and rural states. And I think that, you know, one of the things that will be, that is really important in this process is organizations, no matter, 
it, especially for place-based organizations, is going to be helping contribute to this process because particularly in rural communities, and I mean, I've been doing um, work across uh, rural and urban space in Kentucky for over a decade. Oh, okay. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> that was exciting. <laughs> that was not a comment. On yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> Nor was it planned. <laughs> wow. Well, you all right? I'm fine. All right. <laughs> Just didn't see this. Yeah, it's a bit of a little ledge there. Um, yeah, any, anyhow, I'm glad you're all right, Carolyn. I'm fine. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I think that a lot of the work that happens in, in a lot of the sort of bridge building work and, and honestly, like democracy work that happens in rural communities happens through faith communities. And I know that, that um, you know, the, like faith communities are a part of this. Like it, is, it is in the 12, one of the 12 categories, am I not mistaken? So it'll, I think it'll be really important. But, sorry, one quick thing to that. I do not think that many faith communities consider themselves democracy builders. And so I think mm -hmm. one of the things that it'll be really incumbent upon us, especially those of us that are doing place-based work, especially those that are doing, of us that are doing place-based work in rural states, is going to be helping get that message out there, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Because that work is incredibly important and incredibly transformational. Mm -hmm. um, but it's just work that it will, will be very hard to discover through this process, I think. But mm -hmm. that's on us Oops. to do something to make that possible. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, this the difficulty in keeping it updated, uh, you won't be surprised. Well, I don't think you'll be surprised that when we were first approached to do this project, we said two things had to be understood or we would not undertake it. Number one, that it would be impossible to get every organization, that we would do our best, and if we got to 60%, that would be pretty impressive or whatever we get to. And number two, there was no point in starting this work if it doesn't have an organizational home that is committed to the human and financial resources that it takes to keep it ever green. Because the moment this goes live, it will be out of date. Well, you should all give a round of applause to the National Civic League because they have agreed to do that. Any other comments? I, I think, you know, just the last thing, one of the last things we were talking about is the, the verification, right? So the, the opportunity to both update and verify um, seems like a wonderful opportunity to engage, you know, the 10,000 organizations out there and to do some, you know, sort of larger building of, oh, well, these organizations in our community aren't in there and these organizations that we partner with aren't in there. So I can just imagine it growing. Yeah. Um, from the effort of connection, which feels like a wonderful metaphor for this work. Well said. We were chatting informally for a minute that our fourth audience, which were community leaders, was not represented on this panel. And we know that many people in communities, whether they're leading an educational institute or they're an elected official, are beginning to be really interested in understanding how to bring citizen voice into how they do their business. We believe that that is the audience that will be initially more difficult to get to. But we will go through the national associations, state legislatures, governors associations, to actually bring those kinds of people to the table in addition to what you saw represented in our panel today. Please join me one more time in uh, thanking the panel. Were there any, any more things on this slide? No. So uh, as I said, we'll be able to continue this process at the reception and get more of your thoughts, more of your suggestions about organizations and data and types of groups. Um, so so we'll, be, we'll be doing more of that and we welcome your, your uh, contributions. Uh, we'll be trying to identify over the next uh, couple of months different ways to make this resource accessible to you so that you can be looking up organizations and sectors and states and things like that. Uh, we'll be uh, having various ways of kind of getting feedback beyond this conference uh, to, to make this better. And the last one is uh, identifying communities, actually, that will be using this uh, data and the, the learning from the, the, the resource and this, this community to help build stronger civic infrastructure. Uh, right now, I, so I will be able to continue this at the reception later. Right now, I just want to give you three very, very important words. Lunch is served. So... <laughs> Please come up to the mansard room. You can walk up the stairs and, you know, you work your way into a good appetite, and we'll be seeing you up there in a few minutes. Fourth. 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 Fourth.
Y'all want to get a little, uh, y'all want to get a little...